Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the fourth Sunday in Lent on March 14th, 2021, are Numbers 21, 4 through 9, Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3 and 17 through 22, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and John 3, 14 through 21. Well, we've had gospel texts that have lent themselves really well to questions of why the crucifixion and what does the crucifixion accomplish? John 3, 14 through 21 might be, uh, well, for some of us, maybe the high point of this whole Lenten season. Really? You think? I don't know. I saw it at a football game once on TV, so... <laughs> well, uh, it's funny that you would mention that, Matt, because uh, one of the one of the key issues with this passage uh, from John, of course, you have John three sixteen, and so there's always a, 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 I think, an invitation homiletically to do a little bit of corrective or recontextualization when it comes to a famous verse like this uh, that here is John three sixteen putting it back in its context and. And, and what does it mean? And only the preacher can determine if that's the way to go. But, but the, the verse, of course, that uh, as just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so, man the son, so must the son of man be lifted up. And then combined with the numbers passage, uh, we have, I think, historically a tendency to limit uh, that meaning of lifted up uh, it, to specifically the cross. And uh, while that is certainly true uh, in, in, in the Gospel of John, to remind ourselves that really that lifted up is the, um, is the entirety of the event that the cross sets in motion. So yes, you have the lifting up of Jesus on the cross uh, and where I will you know, bring all people to myself. Uh, that we get uh, that we that we get later on in the gospel, but uh, but that lifting up then is also the resurrection and the ascension, and so I think there's some I, I think there's an opportunity here for a preacher to help people think about uh, what not not just the event of the cross, but what is that what does that cross really mean, or what can it mean? Um, as we push through um, and look forward to Easter. And then especially uh, for John the Ascension, which is just so key that this is all for the sake of, of, of a uh, ongoing, never ending abiding relationship with God. And so uh, that's what the cross really sets in motion, as I said. So that's one, one direction I think that could be important. Can you uh, just say more about that? I mean- um... No, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Please say more about the ascension that it's uh, the, the crucifixion by itself is simply the incarnation um, writ large that Jesus joins us in our um, the condition of sin. Mm -hmm. The resurrection is that Jesus himself is exalted from it, but you need the ascension for then Jesus to make a way for for us to the fathers like in John 14 so that the reason the ascension is is so necessary is it um it 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 then completes uh for lack of a better word the atonement whereby like you said it's not just that jesus then has an ongoing permanent relationship with the father but makes one for us possible right right so the ascension is is really the incarnation full circle coming full circle of a return to the father uh, and that return to the father is uh, it really was you know we were looking forward to that in 151 this descending and ascending uh, but but that's exactly right this is a, this is going to be a fulfillment of 142 in my father's house there are many abiding places and so uh, so that might be that might be exactly the angle that people need to hear this time of this lifting up is uh, is a for the sake of that um, that that relationship that God is that 
that Jesus is preparing or that and um, that place, that abiding place. So, yeah. Any more you want to know about that? When we can well, go in a different direction. Well, well Joy was going to jump into it. So, Matt? Oh, I was just going to do a quick footnote there, but say that it's not just you've got a place with, with, with God after you die, but there's this idea of deeds being done in God right now, that it's a new way of living right mm -hmm. now. This isn't a kind of passive wait for a right. new life. This is a way opened up right now in which you dwell right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, Matt. If I lean into uh, what you raised, um, uh, and I really appreciate the reminder for us that um, uh, this is the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus that is the story we tell. Um, uh, you're right, sometimes we just, we just stop, uh, especially in this season and pull out apart. And the, the way that uh, I like this or the way that I came into it from the Old Testament reading was that um, verse 14 begins uh, as a being rooted in the stories of God, remembered and rehearsed by this community that Jesus uh, is a part of, that Jesus was raised in, that Jesus um, was, was taught in. Uh, that's what I mean by raised at that point. Um, and that that continues, uh, which I think our Ralph and Caroline, you have particularly brought out. It continues in what we rehearse and remember as the full story of the incarnation, that it is the life um, if I piggyback on what Matt was saying, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, that is the story that we tell that, that brings us hope. I did take this in a different direction, though I really, um, I'm really struck by the reminder of the need to carry this through to what does raised mean. I almost don't want to say this, but since my mic is live, um, I will go ahead and mention that one of the things that I asked um, um, around this idea of those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already. Uh, it's verse uh, 18 there. I read that for the first time in a parallel with having received your reward already. Uh, where that idea of, you know, you, you do these things before others and you've received your reward. And I think I, I was um, compelled to go ahead and say this, though I, I love the raising up idea, is because, Matt, what I was thinking of is our lived life now, is um, are we doing things and claiming our reward and caught by that, satisfied by that? Well, are we willing to acknowledge that some of the circumstances we, in, we are in are because we love the darkness and being and loving that darkness, the circumstances we are in is being condemned to that darkness, which we have chosen already. That's a hard lesson uh, to speak but we're living in a hard season that is extended much longer than we ever imagined. And maybe that might be a question that a congregation or a community might need to dwell in. I think that's really important. It, and in terms of sermon prep or in terms of planning a way into that, working with Ephesians 2 is also really appropriate this week that there are some connections there that you might make in terms of um, being already dead and the only way out there being an act of divine mercy and love. That's the thing that, that sets that free, this idea of are you living into these new realities even mm -hmm. now? So I appreciate that a lot. Mm -hmm. I just want to say two quick things about John 3. One would be that that focus on divine love could be a really important way in, that the motive for what John is talking, what Jesus is talking about here in John is a God who loves the world and to spend a little time on that, to ask the question, what difference does it make to believe in a God who acts out of love as opposed to a God who acts out of other motivations and really pursue that for a while here in Lent, uh, here as we move into, into Easter as well. And the second thing is, is similar is with this text, 
what's coming next week, and then the fact that we're in year B, which is really the year of Mark and John, you're going to have a whole lot of John to talk about in Easter, that this is really a good time, perhaps, to start to pull people into some Johannine themes and language and to push that question of love, that the way back to the father, to Jesus' parent that he talks about, isn't just to solve a navigational problem, mm -hmm. but it's to pull people into that same relationship of mutual love and self-giving that he shares mm -hmm. with, with his father. And yeah, that's the thing, that's the goal. It's not, it's not a better life now, or it's not even necessarily happiness. It's to, to have this encounter of divine love with divine love. And I think that that's a really critical um, piece to this, uh, particularly going back to, you know, 314. Uh, and because, and it is, if we look forward to uh, next week, we have, there's really like three, there are no passion predictions, right? And John, but there are sort of three uh, uh, statements of what does this divine love, what does this divine love mean? And so 314, 828, which is never in the lectionary. So you probably don't know that it's even there. And uh, 1232, where uh, where I will lift up all people to myself, and that in in those three places are that lifting up is um, for the sake of John three sixteen for God so loved the world. It's this universal, uh, it's this salvific moment that brings that brings all people. The intention is to bring all people into uh, into this love, and uh, and so. And that, you know, and, and again, those verses that, you know, we, we keep on reading after 316 are like, oh, no wonder we don't have 317 or 18 or what do we do with those verses? But that's what's at stake, actually. Yes. You know, that, that uh, God doesn't judge, we're, we don't judge, but there is a, it, I, I call this passage crisis moments. There's a crisis moment here uh, from uh, the Greek term chrysis, right? Judgment. It, it's a moment of discernment. It's a moment of, of how are you going to live? Uh, uh, are you going to live in the light? Are you going to live in this love? Uh, that's what's at stake. Uh, and, and what's at stake here for the, for the, for the person is, uh, is a mutual relationship. That's, and you have to, and relation, for a relationship to be mutual, you have to respond. <laughs> and so that's the, that's the moment that we're talking about here. Are you responding to this love? How are you responding to this love or not? And, um, but what's at stake is being, being lifted up into this divine love. So I think that's helpful. Yeah, the only thing I want to add uh, to all of that is that I think it also, re the story of Jesus redefines how we think of love. So I, I like what Matt was saying is what does it mean to believe in a guy lo who loves, but the, the, the crisis moment is that there is something wrong with the world. There's something wrong with us um, so that we are already condemned. And so therefore Jesus has to come so that we might be drawn into the light. And so that's the language of light and darkness is used then as, as a metaphor for trying to describe what, what it is that's wrong that Jesus needs to come to heal or fix or redeem or save, whatever metaphor there uh, works best for you. That metaphor here is non-offensive to me. Uh, I know uh, folks sometimes uh, want to uh, ask if they can use the terms light and darkness. Um, and this is one of the key places where I am not at all offended by the use of darkness because it is an extremely countercultural announcement. Because here it says people loved the darkness. And if we take, if I, as a person, uh, uh, an African American person, take that um, to, to be truth, it is very clear that that is not what is happening in our world. And so I'm not offended by this use at this point at all. And uh, I, I, as my Wesleyan um, teaching has to uh, remind me, um, uh, Ralph, I almost thought you were going to say this, but that this condemnation, this crisis moment that we're in didn't just start 
in the first century, or it didn't just start uh, at, at the fall uh, of the destruction of the temple. From the very beginning, um, we were created in this relationship with God. And this entire story is God recovering that original intent. And sometimes I think we need to be reminded that the story begins with good news. We're in a great relationship with God. We choose to step out of that relationship and God continues to edit the story to write us back in ultimately with the life, death, resurrection, and ascension and promised return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I am wondering if, um, if Joy, if your Wesleyan tradition or Carolina Rolf, if your Lutheran tradition um, can make sense of Numbers 21, 4 through 9. <laughs> I could totally make sense of it. I just don't know if I have time. Because <laughs> we um, just talked about a God of love and here's the God of love sending snakes. And then they say, get rid of the snakes. And God's like, well, I'll give you something to look at that heals you, but you're still going to get bit by snakes because, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, it's um, it's one of the reasons um, this passage connected with Isaiah 6 and uh, is one of the reasons why why the the serpent in Genesis 3 is likely um, a spiritual being, not just a snake, but... Um, that's going to mess up a lot of artwork and stuff. Wait, so is this where snakes are created then? Nope, snakes aren't created here. Snakes are not part of the original creation, right? They come into being here. No, no I didn't say it. That. Stop it. Listen to what Rolf said. And where are the dinosaurs? <laughs> Keep going. So, by the way, so here's the great thing about this passage. Uh, uh, that the Lord sent poisonous serpents, right? Um, do you know what the word for poisonous is? And I, now I got to look this up just to make sure I'm not lying totally. <laughs> but so we curious. have time to guess? Yes, you have, you have a minute to guess. It's probably something like feline. It's probably like oh. a word for cat probably comes no, from it. No, it's seraphim. No. Yeah. So the Nakashim seraphim are poisonous snakes. As, or, that is burning. Uh, the word means burning because when you get bit by uh, something with venom, it, it, it's the sensation of burning. And so therefore in, Je uh, in Isaiah 6, when it says the seraphim, it's the adjective has become a substantive. I know I'm going deep. I love it when I talk like this, this is uh, deep into grammar. So that's why we believe those in Genesis 6, the seraphim are actually serpent spiritual right uh it's it, the imagination of the seraphim is they are snake angels that really ruins the song like the the cherubim and the seraphim like well cherubs are lions and seraphs are snakes wait cherubs are what lions see I you are messing up the i need to i need to teach all you guys some old testament um imagery apparently apparently cherubs yeah the cherubim are lions with with wings and the seraphim are snakes with wings. So C.S. Lewis was right. This is this is. Yeah. I I need a I need a time out here. I need to rethink the you know, all. <laughs> but I love Angels, the story. We've heard on high is a little scarier now, isn't it? I know, right? <laughs> totally. But then you get back to Numbers uh, twenty-one, and it's the people always complaining and speaking against God. I mean, uh, that is, you know, what one great thing about this story is. Um, how much in the wilderness the people still always want to go back to Egypt. And uh, just to recognize everybody, uh, one of our bishops says, every church has a back to Egypt committee. Oh. And, and every seminary has a back to Egypt committee. It's called the faculty meeting. And then every, you know, uh, <laughs> well, that is, you know, we, uh, we, we're afraid to go into God's future. We're, we're afraid to walk with God into the future where God is leading us often. And, and so we romanticize and nostalgicize. That's not a word. We have nostalgia for the past uh, and making it better than it was and complaining. And uh, I think this story um, is part of that bigger narrative. Otherwise, otherwise it's just like, oh, in John three, uh, they said Moses lifted up a snake. All right, let's have that story. You know, is the Old Testament reading, and it's not otherwise. It doesn't do much, does it? Yeah. 
This is fascinating. And I'm going to add a different twist. Bring it um, on. I, I, I looked at something. And again, this is one of those times when um, preparing for this podcast allows me to ask questions that I haven't asked before. And what jumped out for me this time was uh, right there uh, where it says to, uh, that um, they were set out uh, by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom but the people became impatient on the way. And the question is, what is this path leading us around? And this path meaning the path that we're on. What, what is it leading us around? And it's a question of, is it leading us around um, our impatience for waiting on God? Is it leading us into waiting on God? Is, is it leading us around our enemies? Is it leading us toward, in this particular case, you know, um, the poisonous snakes? Just, just lingering with that question. What is this path leading us around? It just stuck out at me. Um, I don't have any content for it, but that was just a question that I raised. Well, I, I think that question, along with what Rolf said, uh, about about nostalgia or going back, you know, going back to Egypt. I think that that homiletically, those could be some really uh, meaningful entries into where people are, yeah. uh, particularly as we navigate what is uh, the second our second pandemic lens, uh, and 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 those desires that have been expressed about going back to the way it was before with church and 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 we can't. Uh, and so what does that, maybe, maybe the, this is a big be beginning place to start thinking about thinking, think, you know, talking ecclesiology, um, and talking theologically about what's, what's changing now, or what has changed, uh, that, that we, yeah, we can't, we can't go back to the way it was before. Uh, and when and how are we going to start having those kinds of conversations or, what does this mean for who, who we think God is? Uh, I think could be, I, I think it'd be important to hear in a sermon. A word I made last Lent, um, and I'm gonna probably get in trouble with some of my United Methodist, uh, some of our United Methodist listeners here, but a question I asked just as we were thinking that our general conference was going to be postponed, which of course it was, um, was if it was postponed, that all of us needed to reconsider, all of us meaning whatever we thought the next future of our denomination should be, what the next future of the church, if I go broader than uh, my, my context, uh, should be, what is this path lead, what has this path led us around? Have the question I asked last Lent was, if po general conference is postponed, all of us, no matter what side of the issues we are on, need to get on our knees and ask God, am I really listening to your voice or should I be hearing from someone else? And that, that's the question. What, 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 what is this path leading us around? What, if, what has been prevented that we should pay attention to, Caroline, as you say, as we move into this, this current future? Okay. One quick thing to say before we can move either to uh, the epistle or the psalm, and that is that um, as the commentary notes, and I do like the way the commentary starts just with uh, reality bites, that's a funny joke. Um, the uh, Later on, th this, the, the, the serpent on, on the pole um, became an object of idol worship so that Hezekiah had to destroy it as part of his religious reform. And so there's something also about the deep, deep about the human nature, about how we turn even um, images of God's salvation, we turn them into idols that we worship in place of God. Um, but uh, you could uh, go lots of directions with that. I, uh, which, uh, where would you guys wanna go next? Uh, Thanks for lifting that, Rolf. I, I, I did appreciate that in the commentary, and I do think that that's worth uh, considering um, because we are in a moment where going back to, to Egypt, going back to normal might be more a commitment to an idolatry mm -hmm. than a commitment to God. 
-hmm. Well, for Psalm 107, we've got commentary by a, an ambitious young scholar named Rolf Jacobson. Who's <laughs> never written about the Psalms before. Which you might uh, want to check him out. But I, I appreciate the way you talked about the sustaining power of the word here and what was that idea of, um, of God sending out God's word and that creating healing. And that's, that's not a word where God says, hey, cheer up. But it's the bigger kind of systemic idea of God's presence in creation. And of course, has more particular elements through the prophets and certainly in Jesus. But it's, it's this idea of, um, well, I don't know. This is an idea, I guess, of God's sustaining presence that isn't necessarily always uh, a special or what we might call a miraculous breakthrough kind of thing, but shows up in other ways too, if I read you right, at least. Yeah, and the and the the continuity. I mean, I I just one of the things about this psalm that's like you know just so obvious, but yet how how is it that our time you know these words uh, have more of an impact? But steadfast love, mm. right? That's you know that uh, which I think relates to what you were talking about, Matt, and what you were talking about in your commentary, Rolf, is that. Uh, just thanking God for God's steadfast love that, yeah, that not, is not necessarily like dropping things from the sky or miraculous moments or whatever, but the steadfastness of God's love, uh, just to pause and think about that and, and sit in that reality, uh, I, I think could be, I think could be a really powerful sermon, um, to, to explore. Of, of what that what that means and how much we count on that uh, and especially now uh, so yeah good you know I just uh, this one of the reasons you go back and you redo exegesis every time you preach or teach on something mm -hmm. is you will see new things mm -hmm. uh, and so for me this was just again why um, Here's a passage I know really well um, because Psalm 107 is such an important psalm to me, although it's so big, it's so long, it really, most people don't know it. Uh, I was teaching some pastors a couple summers ago and one of them said, why don't I know this psalm? We were looking at all of Psalm 107. But just to, then to see this phrase, he sent out his word and then track it down, um, you know, using basic, you know, search uh, and dictionary things. And then having that then open up a new reality that you see a continuity with the phrase and a concept that I hadn't ever seen. It's why you do, for me, it was just a affirmation again of why we do what we do. And mm -hmm. uh, pastors and preachers do what they do is you get to study the word uh, in part, uh, you know, as part of your vocation. How awesome is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Caroline, you always, um, uh, and you've already said today, that reminder about uh, uh, that John uh, 3 is about all the world. And uh, I read that, uh, just that, that lifted that out of uh, Psalm 107 this time. Um, those, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands the East and the West, the North and the South, right there, mm -hmm. that, that steadfast love, that uh, continuation of God's intention from the beginning to gather in all the world. That stood out for me uh, in this Psalm. Mm -hmm. Ephesians? Well, Ephesians, yeah. I think whoever reads Ephesians 2 has got to really punch the start of verse 4. We've that but God, you know, that the way in which you let this reading tell a story of, of salvation, that mm -hmm. this is that's the moment of divine intervention in this, this problematic, troubled, death dealing <laughs> landscape. Uh, and again, that statement, but God, comma, rich in mercy, out of the great love with which God loved us. Um, and again, to explore part of what that means as, as the motivation for, for our salvation, however you want to explain that salvation. And Ephesians certainly gives you a lot of language to, uh, to latch on to. Yeah, well, the, lang the language of death and new life there is uh, pretty helpful. 
you know, dead in our trespasses and sins uh, in which we once lived. I mean, you know, it's uh, pretty helpful. And then, of course, you get the money verse, right? Uh, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, 